The Dallas Mavericks keep rolling, improving their road record to 11-2 and on the season. If you consider just what they've done in the last couple road games, it's really impressive. Between Milwaukee and Philadelphia tonight, they had only lost a couple of, like between them, only a couple of home games all season. The Mavericks win both in their house, and in both cases, obviously, without their own superstar, Luka Doncic. This is remarkable. If they could take any of that any of that magic that they have at on the road and apply it in their home games, this team would be unstoppable because the Mavericks are 19-9 overall at this point, and they're 11-2 on the road. They are ridiculously good when they have to play with their backs to the wall. And I don't know why that is that they can't apply that same magic at home, but their record is basically 500 at home. So yeah, you're talking like eight and seven at home compared to 11 and two on the road this year. That uh, that is remarkable. It's the complete flip flop of what they were last year, where they only won nine games on the road all of last season. Here, they're road warriors, man. They are a team nobody wants to draw. At home. Now, you might think about it. Most teams, obviously, for obvious reasons, are going to be better at home than they're going to be on the road. So you're like, hey, if we're going to face the Mavericks, it makes sense that we want to face them on our, you know, on our court. Not so much in this case, though. The Mavericks substantially tougher to beat on the road. This game, though, this game got off to an impressive statement by the Mavericks. They scored 35 points in the first quarter. Tim Hardaway Jr., the unsung man, the man that I have just murdered so many times in post-game shows throughout this season, bounces back with another strong game. 19 points in the first quarter alone. Five of five from beyond the arc. Puts Dallas out to an early advantage. And that was that was huge. I mean, he has 27 points for the game. Obviously, he got 19 in that first frame. And just his shooting lifted the team as a whole. And then you got KP continuing to ball out. At this point, I'm convinced K- KP is on the, on the return at this point. He's on his way back to his former self. Because we've talked about it. You see that aggression from him now. He's dunking. He's attacking the basket ferociously. He's dunking on fools and catching bodies like nobody's business. He is lethal right now. You see just the maturation. Not so much maturation. That's not the right term. You see the comfort level returning for him. Because early in the year, like that last dunk in the final minute of the game, it didn't have an impact on the you know, on the result or anything like that. But it's just another statement from him. Uh, early in the year, that would have been a contested 18-footer. He probably pump fakes and does a pull-up dribble or something. Then a couple weeks ago, we talked about how, hey, man, anytime this dude puts the ball on the floor, he's getting stripped. He's getting ripped. It's not good. He He's gotten past that as well now. And now you see him just attacking the basket relentlessly. And you're starting to see some of those shots fall. KP in this game, 22 points, a career high. 18 rebounds and three block shots. I know Joel Embiid had himself an even bigger day, 33 and 17. But you know what? I'm going to still say KP more than held his own. This is not typically a matchup where he would be able to flex at all. I know that the Mavericks employ different defenders and whatnot. But KP definitely continuing to show his elite level defense. And yeah, the rebounding, he's, he's becoming an elite rebounder at this point. Like, to me, uh, maybe elite is a strong word. But at this point, this is his, what, fifth consecutive 2010 game at this point? Longest stretch of his career doing that. He's lifted and elevated his game without Luka. And 37 minutes again tonight, it looks like the Mavericks are starting to lift that minutes restriction on him that we saw earlier in the year. They've really unchained him the last couple games, letting him go 38 and 37 minutes respectively. And he rewards them with 10 of 19 from the field, 2 of 6 from 3. Like I said, 3 blocks and a steal. He's a plus 16 on the game. I didn't mention Tim Hardaway shooting earlier. 10 of 21 for him, 7 of 11 for 3 from 3. Uh, and a steal as well, four boards for him. It's amazing how much... I mean, the fact that Dallas... We knew the KP deal, obviously, was 
uh, centered around him. Everything was him and Hardaway Jr. and Courtney Lee and Trey Burke were just parts that we had to take back in the deal to you know help New York do whatever they thought they wanted to do, even though it didn't work out for them very much. And at this point, we we figured we'd get KP rounding back into form. We did not think that we would get a quality scorer in Tim Hardaway Jr. And I still keep waiting for it. I keep waiting for it. And I'm not backing down because just one more game has passed and suddenly I'm going to flip roles from what I said at the last post-game show when they lost to the Celtics and uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. wasn't anything that impressive again. I'm not going to suddenly be like, ah, you know what? I take it back. This is just the new Tim Hardaway Jr. You know, quality. And we, we now have to treat his bad games as a surprise as opposed to a, hey man, his whole career tells you he's a streaky scorer and he's been feast or famine all year. Now through the first little stretch of the year, the first 10 games or so, he was largely famine. But where he's been since then now, as we approach 30 games on the year, he is more often than not feasting in these games. And this this is another example of it. Again, 27 points from the other, from really the worst contract of that bunch that we had to take on. I mean, I guess you could say Courtney Lee is the worst one because I think he's making like $14 million this year and we're not even really playing him. But even still, Tim Hardaway Jr. making more than $20 million this season. Crazy high number, and no, he's not worth that value. But you know what? As long as you're getting use out of it, it at least takes a little bit of that sting out. And uh, he's he is a third, most nights, a critical third scorer for this team. Right now, he's having to step up and be the second scorer, and we know he will never shy away from pulling the trigger on a shot. And right now, that's what we need because he's getting the majority of the shots right now. Him and KP pretty much eating all the shots in this case. 19 for KP, 21 for Hardaway. The next highest Maverick in terms of shot attempts was Jalen Brunson at 9. Significant step down there. So for now, Tim Hardaway Jr. is getting that role exactly like he wanted it. And he's making it work. Uh, Another strong outing from Brunson, close to a double-double. In this case, 11.7 rebounds. For, For Dallas, what I really felt best about in this game is... Yeah, it it wasn't all rosy, right? I mean, they end up shooting 42% from three in the game, 52% from the field. So the offense was on point. Like, you were manhandling Philadelphia in this game. And Philadelphia, in the second half, didn't really look like they were there. Like, they didn't look like they were going to have any chance of really creeping back into it. I think they cut it to seven at one point, about close to midway in the fourth quarter and Dallas immediately pushed it back out to 15. And then it just seemed like Philadelphia kind of was like, ah, okay, whatever. But in this game, the Mavericks really just controlled throughout. They led by six at half, 63, 57. You already had 50% shooting for Dallas from three. Uh, they got to the line pretty well as well. Seven of 11 in that case. The only thing that was a little off for Dallas in this case, their turnovers were high. I've been talking about how they average about a little, right around 12 a game uh, on the season. In this case, they had a lot more turnovers, 16 for the game. That's still quality for most teams. That still would put them in the top five in terms of fewest turnovers per game. But you did have an uptick there. They had 11 and a half, so much better in the second half, which is when they really seized firm control of the game and never looked back. Uh, They out-rebounded Philadelphia as well. When you consider that in this game you didn't have your full stable of guys and you were still able to make things work, that's really, really impressive because there's no reason that there's there's no reason to expect oh well, I say this. Coming in, I wasn't super optimistic about this game. And I think I need to change that perspective because yes, we had Curry, even though we thought we might not. Yes, we had DeLon Wright, even though we thought we might not. It was a sore back for Curry and a sprained finger, I want to say, for DeLon Wright. But you get 21 minutes out of Curry, and he gives you 11 points on 4 of 8 shooting, 1 of 3 from 3. DeLon Wright, 23 minutes, 8 and 7 on 2 of 3 shooting as well. So you saw they still contributed. They still played fairly substantial minutes, more than 20 apiece. And when you have this team, not even at full strength, like this team, everybody is figuring out their role. No For those asking, this team is not somehow better without Luka. They're not. What I do think is that they're having to operate without him. Just like I said 
uh, when the Mavericks lost Dirk in the 2010-2011 season. It was December 2010 uh, when he went down with the injury. He missed about 15 games, I want to say. And for a while, the Mavericks kind of fell into disarray after a best start in franchise history through about 30 games. And while everything seemed like it was unraveling, you saw them kind of start to uh, piece things together a little bit, and you saw them learn to play without Dirk and learn to really compete in these games without Dirk. And I think that's kind of what this bunch is doing, although I think they're doing it at an even faster clip, obviously, than those Mavericks did. Because, yeah, KP's been a top dog before, even though we're not feeding him crazy amounts of shots. We're not running every possession through him and saying, all right, this guy's got to get everything, and everyone else is getting table scraps. They're not doing that. They're not putting everything on his shoulders like you saw more so in New York. Uh, You're seeing a better distribution. It's more of Carlisle's. Uh, system in this regard. Luca, we know, is allowed to kind of be the point general in this case. He's allowed to run the offense himself. Carlisle uh, has let him off the leash a little bit and lets him initiate a lot of the offense because he understands that's part of what makes him so special. But this group, you don't have that same element. And so in this case, it is a little bit more structured. And that, that works great in this case, but there's going to be times where it, it gets you only so far, right? You still got to have the special talent to take it over the top. And I think that this bunch is very good at playing, uh, playing their roles and understanding what their task is in this case. KP has elevated his game unquestionably in Luka's absence. Now, I want to see, I got the stat here somewhere. Um, here's an interesting note from Tim McMahon on Twitter. The 76ers were 14 at home, 14 and 0 at home a few days ago. In this game, they were getting booed by their own fans. That is a uh, that's pretty remarkable, actually, when you consider that. Like you were 14 and 0 at home a few days ago, and you're already booing your your team. Good job. Philadelphia fans are an interesting type, man. I don't I don't know what exactly to make of it. Uh, Brad Townsend says this is four straight 2010 games for Porzingis who had never had such a run before. And uh, yes, as I said earlier, career high, 18 rebounds. Crazy, crazy production out of him there. Uh, Let's see, let's see. I mentioned earlier the 11-2 record for the Mavs on the road. And and I've mentioned it before. I've run down the resume, right? Nuggets, Rockets, Lakers, Bucks, Sixers. The last two, he didn't even have Luka. And the Nuggets game, Luka scored 12, a season-low 12 points. Well, not a season low. Miami is a season low because he only played like two minutes and scored two points, but I digress. Essentially for a full game, a season low, and you won that game. It's just one of those things where this team is finding what fits, what works for them, and they're playing up to their potential. Uh, Let's see here. I'm trying to find one particular call out. I want to say it was Mark Followell. Nope, you know what? It's uh, Nick Angstad on Twitter. Uh, Porzingis' last three games without Luka. 26 points, 12 rebounds, 4 assists, 2 blocks, and a win at Milwaukee. 23 points, 13 rebounds, 2 assists, 3 blocks, and a loss against the Celtics. 22 points, 18 rebounds, 0 assists, 3 blocks, and a win at Philadelphia. This team is very, very... um, They're good, man. And I'm... I'm really tempted to collect some receipts here because there are a lot of people who talk basketball, even on YouTube, other YouTubers who I actually have a lot of respect for. But when they were hyping up Luca a couple weeks ago, they would they would say, you know, Luca is transcendent and KP, he's not quite himself yet, but he's still a quality player. But then the rest of the bench, they would use the term garbage. The rest of the Mavericks role players are garbage. Really? KP's elevated his game without Luka, no doubt. But uh, to suggest that somehow, some way, this team is garbage around those two is a garbage take. It makes no sense. You're you're looking at the fact that you're like, oh well, it's largely the same team that you know was under underwhelming last year. In that case, we saw Luka play with those guys last year, and if he wasn't on the floor, especially after the trade deadline, they struggled. So therefore, they must be garbage. You're not paying attention this year. You're assuming everything is Luka. A lot of it is Luka. He puts guys in great position uh, to succeed. 
but it's not all Luka. You have to give guys credit for what they do themselves. You have to give Tim Hardaway Jr. credit, even even without Luka, even without being perfectly spoon-fed some of these looks. He's playing really well right now. Best he's played in a few years, probably. Uh, KP, Seth Curry. Seth Curry's been much better. DeLon Wright coming back from his injury, his groin or abductor muscle injury. Regardless, coming back from injury, he's been quality for the Mavericks as well. So there's just a lot of guys who understand how to impact the game in their own way. They understand their role. They're sticking to it. And it's effective. It's effective. It's a well-coached team. And it's a complete team. You don't have that one third standout guy. A lot of nights, I guess right now, it's going to be Hardaway Jr., other times it's going to tag in and it's going to be Seth Curry, but you are going to have the aberrations where it's going to be a Dorian Finney-Smith going for a career-high 20 points like he did against San Antonio, I believe it was. You you are going to have those games. You're going to have games where it's Maxi Kleba with 17 or more points, where it's Dwight Powell with 20-plus points on near-perfect shooting. Like It's going to move and rotate, and it's just a matter of doing what you have to as a team to win the game it's not just about it's not just about chasing stats it's really not and that's the thing is Luca said earlier before the season even started he doesn't even care about awards or accolades the only thing that he thinks would be a cool accomplishment other than of course playoffs or championship or whatever the cool accomplishment he said he would like to achieve in his career and that he could achieve presumably uh, this year, which I don't think he's on pace to do it by any means, uh, is leading the league in assists because he says that's not just about me. That's about my teammates as well, and it's helping everybody. It's not like it's not the same thing as like oh a scoring title, if you will. So pretty cool perspective in that regard. When you got a guy who averages about twenty nine thirty points a game this year, still more focused on getting his team involved. And that's the thing. When Luca comes back and you have all these guys, I don't think it's going to be like a, a reintegration process where Luca comes back and they have to figure out, all right, how do we all play together again? And suddenly KP's like, oh, I forgot how to basketball again. I don't think that's going to be the problem. I think at this point, guys have kind of settled in a little bit to their role. They understand it. If anything, Luca's crazy high usage rate might slightly dial back just a little bit because while he is still the orchestrator of this historic offense right now as it stands right now points per 100 possessions this is the most potent offense in nba history even greater than last year's warriors team with durant curry thompson and uh green and all them so yeah he, he might be the orchestrator behind that the maestro if you will but he's still not uh i don't think you're gonna have to ask as much out of him every single possession right like guys like brunson who haven't shined at all point all parts of this year i think you'll see them be effective as well and that'll allow luca to play a little bit off the ball a little bit for a change and still making contributions still making plays but just less of okay get the ball to luca and figure out where the hell to go and you know he'll find you or whatever but the usage rate's crazy high right now I don't like that kind of high usage rate because even if you try and even even though he's 20 years old and even though you're going to try and strategically rest him here and there where you can ahead of any kind of playoff series, you still have to factor in when your usage rate is that high, even though you have games where you might not have to play him in the fourth quarter, it's still a heavy burden on him and physically it will wear you down. Mark Followell on Twitter after the game points out the Mavericks are the highest scoring first quarter team in the league, now averaging 30 points per first quarter. They had 35, as I mentioned earlier, in the first quarter tonight with Hardaway Jr. setting the tone with 19 of his game high 27. Not a game high. Embiid had 33, but uh, team high for sure. Team high 27 points in the first quarter. Dallas is 12-1 and when they score 30 plus in the first quarter. So, there you go. This team is great at setting the tone. Luka is fantastic. If you look at where Luka does the majority of his damage quarter-wise, it's the first and third quarter respectively. And that makes sense, right? We know Luka doesn't play nearly half of the fourth quarter in terms of where his minutes per fourth quarter average rates. He's somewhere in the, like the, the low 100s. Like He's not high in that regard, but it's because he does a lot of damage to open the game, and then he does a lot of damage in the third quarter. That's been kind of 
his uh, yin and yang. And that's not a good analogy at all because those are supposed to be opposites. Whatever. That's where he's done the majority of his damage. And it's been the second and fourth quarters where he's been a little more quiet. But, you know, in the fourth quarter, he'll step up his game when he comes in and he'll try and make some plays and he'll still impact it. But it's just if you look at the percentage of where his points go, that's how they fall. So the first quarter makes total sense most of the time for the Mavericks. And in this case tonight, it was Hardaway Jr. going five for five from three in that quarter that opened everything up. So uh, this is all things Mavs Twitter as well. He points out KP finished tonight's game with 22 points, 18 boards, and three blocks. Only two players have done that this year. Andre Drummond and Clint Capella. That's pretty exceptionally rare you know, territory there in terms of, you know, you got three guys who have accomplished that kind of stat line this year. And of them, if you had to, if, it, if it's like a, hey, pick one, I got the one I want. I got KP. I got what I want. So, yeah, KP, man, this is this is the best news for the Mavericks. Like, it was a silver lining, first, that Doncic isn't hurt long term. Still seems like even though he did some wind sprints before the game that he's being a little bit ginger with the ankle, just a little bit. He's still being a little cautious with it. Makes it feel like it might still be a little bit of time out before he returns. But one, if the team is playing like this, they don't need to rush him back. By any means, they don't need to rush him back. And two, a silver lining as well as the fact that in his absence, KP has had to assume a larger responsibility, a larger burden in that case. And KP has thrived thus far in it now he hasn't popped off for another 30 point game or anything like that but he's controlling the game while staying within his role his new role that he's developed with dallas and rick with rick carlisle and that's to me what's even more impressive right his shooting percentages are creeping back north in the right direction as north tends to be in such an analogy uh and he's just he's continuing to crash the boards crash the glass but now you see the aggression now you see the fearlessness as he attacks the basket, as he's catching bodies and dunking on fools. That's exactly what this team needs from him. It doesn't just energize the team, but it's it's energizing for the long run, not just in the scope of the game. Like they see that and they understand, dude, Luca is already doing stupid, crazy good things right now. So many, so many words in that expression. Stupid, crazy good things right now. And when he returns. Now that KP's starting to click, it's going to be it's going to be game over. Like Dallas is fourth in the West right now, and like I said, they've been better on the road versus home. Not even not even a question. But Dallas, in terms of their efficiency, when you got like the the trio of Luca, KP, and Dwight Powell on the floor together, is absurdly high. And I know Dwight Powell's been a very polarizing figure this year. I've called him out a couple times as well. But, yeah, when you look at him in terms of the pick and roll, what he opens up, what Luka's efficiency is with him on the floor, what the trio of the uh, him, KP, and Luka is, you kind of understand why Dallas rolls with that and why, yeah, that's why they re-signed him to the deal they did because it makes a lot of sense with this team and with the talent they have. Now, could you find someone, uh, another front court player, to help you in that regard because you're rolling with KP and, or excuse me, um, with Dwight and Maxi a lot in a heavy role in that regard because KP doesn't play a whole lot of the five right now. Yeah, you are. Uh, you could upgrade a little bit in that regard, but you, it's not like you're you're taking them out entirely. You're going to have to work around it and figure out the right balance, but it's not like you just go, okay, wipe the slate clean and move on. We're not going to have Dwight Powell in this scenario anymore. I don't see him being moved in a Dallas deal at this point. I really think this team, they'll make a move at the deadline. I have no... I have no question about that, but here's the difference. It's not going to be it's not going to be a Rajon Rondo type move. It's not going to be a blockbuster that shakes the team to its foundation and takes what was even in that year a an, an historically good offense and basically says to hell with it all. I don't think this can win in the playoffs as constructed. Therefore, we're going to shake it to its core, and we're going to hope that we can pick up the pieces in this short time between the trade deadline and the playoffs. They didn't, and it was a disaster. They're not going to do that this time. Whatever move they do make, they'll they'll sure up the team. They'll make a move that helps them, but they're not going to impact. They're not going to undermine the chemistry and the rhythm 
of this offense. You're not going to see them put another non-floor spacer out there unless it's someone that can really swallow up rebounds for them, which as a team, they're not rebounding that poorly this year, but they need someone like that. And if they look that direction, there are options out there, but they're not going to spend big for it. Whatever they do, they're not going to spend big. I'm trying to see if there's anything else I want to call out here from the notes I took during the game. Uh, I think that pretty much covers the primary bases here. Dallas, again, 117-98. Another quality, quality win on the road. And the fact that they're doing this against two teams, two of the better teams in the Eastern Conference without their own superstar, and they're still... Like, they're still not only competitive, but they're winning. And I know the Milwaukee game got real iffy there at the end, but they dominated in that game. They, it fell apart a little bit late, but they still hung on to win. They dominated Philly at home, though. So for the most part, this team is showing not only can we win without Luka, we can absolutely wreck you even without our superstar MVP candidate. And that's is how you give notice to the rest of the league. So, yeah, bright things to look forward to, bright future ahead for the Mavericks. I don't know how good this team's team's, uh, ceiling looks like, how high it is, but I do know this. Health permitting, knock on wood, health permitting, this team is going to be a nightmare for anybody they match up with in the playoffs and i'm gonna i'm gonna even stand my ground on that and say even a a matchup like the clippers who you know we've only seen them once this year they're the only team in the west that thoroughly seemed to handle dallas kp is not in the same space he was in at that point the mavs bench wasn't very strong that game and luca was a little bit bothered by the length and everything of of their perimeter defenders i'm gonna go out on a limb and say you know what i feel damn confident in the Mavericks and their coaching staff because I've seen Rick Carlisle squeeze blood out of a stone before in terms of his roster. Take rosters that weren't very good and squeeze blood out of that stone to get them into the playoffs. Or, as was the case in the 2014 playoffs against the one-seeded Spurs, the eventual champions, he took them to the brink with a Mavs roster that wasn't that great. It was good, but it wasn't great. It had no business pushing the Spurs to the brink. Now, we got our asses whipped in Game 7 in San Antonio. Only Game 7 Dirk ever lost in his playoff career. But I digress. The point is, you have a brilliant coach in that regard who you give him a seven-game series. If you're going to ask me who would I rather have, Doc Rivers or Rick Carlisle, I'm going to take Rick Carlisle every damn time. Every damn time. And I'm going to take the combination of Luka, KP, and this bench, how we see it. I'm going to take that, and I'm going to say I like our chances. Not even a puncher's chance. I'm going to say we can go toe-to-toe, and we'll see where we'll, we'll see where things fall. But I can see them going toe-to-toe with anybody, including a very tough defensive team in the Clippers, who are struggling to find their own way right now. They've been stumbling a bit as of late. But I'm going around in circles at this point, guys. Quality Mavericks win. Very bright future things to look forward to. That's going to do it for my time, though. I've been DDP. Thank you for watching this video. Don't forget to leave a like and a comment below. Uh, Subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. And until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Salute.